and in order. Second, he should have a good head. Well, that kind of allows me to be on the edge of that one. He should have a good power of language, a good voice, a good memory, which I guarantee you I'm out of that one. He should know when to stop. I had a, a, a teacher one time tell me, the mind can absorb only as much as the rear end can endure. He also says that he should be ready to stake body and soul, goods and reputations on the truth. That he should study diligently and that he should suffer himself to be criticized by everyone. Well, I'll tell you what, if I would have heard that before I went into preaching school, I'm not sure I would have gone in. Because preaching the word of God is a serious business. And those of us that preach need to be of one voice. To do that, we need to make sure that we preach the Word of God and nothing else but the Word. Paul is writing to a young Timothy to encourage him when he says, preach the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure, endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, right? they will uh, heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. If we are going to be of one voice. We need to be ready in season. We need to be ready out of season to preach the Word of God and nothing more. We use God's Word to convince and rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering. But we need to use God's Word. I did a word search on Bible Gateway in the New King James and I put in the Word of the Lord. It's found 247 times in the Old Testament, 14 times in the New Testament. Then I put in the Word of God, and that's found five times in the Old Testament, 42 times in the New Testament. What it's basically telling me is that the Bible is God's Word. And if we're going to preach, we need to preach God's Word. That's the first part of his letter to the Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. God's word and only God's word has the power for salvation. And we can get off in all these other different uh, ways of teaching, but it's not God's word. We need to get into God's word and stay in God's word. Turn to, to Psalm 119. And in Psalm 119 are several instances that tell us about the power of God's Word. Yeah. Verse 9 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. And so word, the Word of God is a source of cleansing, a source of cleaning. Drop on down to verse 24 and it says, Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselor. You want to find true counseling? Go to God's Word. God's Word will be your counselor for you. Go down to verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your Word. The source of life? God's Word. Verse 28. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your Word. God's Word is the tower of strength. It is where we get our strength to endure and to face what life uh, throws in our direction. Verse 41, Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your Word. So we may think, well, okay, God's Word, well, we hear that, we read that in the New Testament. No, that's throughout all of God's Word because God's Word as a whole is our way to salvation. In verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. God's word is better than any riches that we may have. 
So we don't need to jazz up God's Word. What we need to do is preach God's Word. And if we're going to have one voice, that's what we do. We preach the Word of God and only the Word of God. And there's some that, that feel that we need to entertain in order to draw people in. God's Word is enough. The Los Angeles Times Magazine once reported on a church in Southern California that advertises its service as God's country good time hour and promises line dancing following the worship service. Their band is called the Honky Tonk Angels. And their pastor, their minister, takes part in that. Wall Street Journal described the church in America's Bible Belt that calls itself the Fellowship of Excitement. It ran an advertisement for a Sunday evening service that read this way. Circus. See Barnum and Bailey vested as the magic of the big top circus comes to the Fellowship of Excitement. Clowns, acrobats, popcorn. What a great night. And you see these things and you wonder about these types of trends. Because whatever they are, they're not worship. They are not worshiping God Almighty. They're entertainment, but they're not worshiping. We are here to praise and worship God. We do that through His Word. How in the world can they call it worship when they don't use God's Word? When they don't extract from God's word. When they don't apply God's word. It can't be worship. If it's not God's word. True worship is praising God for who he is. Yeah. And what he has done for us. God and only God deserves that praise. And if that is not the very center of our preaching. If that is not the very center of our worship. Then we are off the wrong track. We need to be about preaching and teaching the truth. And if we're going to have one voice, that's how we do it. With the truth, God's truth. How many of you know how the FBI studies counterfeit money? They study the real thing. They don't spend time studying all these different kinds of counterfeit money. They study the real money. Why? So that if anything counterfeit comes across, anything funny, anything out of ordinary comes across their desk, they recognize it. That's not the real deal. If we are to preach, we need to preach the real thing. And the way to do that is we need to get into God's Word to preach it. So that if anything comes out of my mouth that's different from this, you better believe God's Word and not what I say. You better believe what God's Word says. And so your responsibility, as well as my responsibility, is to get into God's Word, to study the truth. So that if anything comes across our desk, comes across our worship service that is not in God's Word, we know it to be false. Because it's not the truth. When it comes to church, people come in expecting to hear the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. How many of you have ever gone over to someone's house expecting a big meal only when you get there to get these little finger foods. And you might try to fill yourself up with it, but when you leave, you're still hungry. And so on the way home, what do you do? You stop off at any fast food restaurant to get something to fill yourself up with. People come to the service to get filled with God's truth. And if we don't fill them with God's truth, they leave hungry. The way that we fill them is with God's Word. There's a lot of people that leave Sunday morning hungry because they're not fed the Word of God. They're not fed the truth. The truth should be the basis of all that we teach. Our teaching should be rooted in the ground, uh, grounded in God's Word, in God's truth. Everything we, sh we preach should line up against the Word of God. 
I don't care if it's what John Wesley said. I don't care if it's what Martin Luther said. I don't care if it's what Augustine said. I don't care if it's what Brother Norris said. I don't care if it's what I say. If it's not lining up with God's Word, you better believe God's Word. We need to be sure we are preaching the truth. And when we do, we are one voice. I remember back in school, back in 1996. And as I said, we would have uh, students go up and, and, and preach sermons. And so that was how one of the ways that we'd learn. And so one of my co-students was up there and he was preaching. And he said this statement. It was the first time, first time I'd ever heard this statement. He said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. And then he followed it up with this. And that's wrong. Because God said it. That settles it whether I believe it or not. God said it. God's word is truth. It's God's word that leads us to salvation. Jesus talks about his, or prays to, about his disciples in John 17, 17, where he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth, and it contains the truth for salvation. We call it the good news for a reason. It's the gospel because it has the power of God for salvation to all who believe and obey. God's word contains us wisdom for how we should live our lives. And if everyone in the world lived the way God wanted us to live, the world would be such a beautiful place to live. Because God's word is what is best for us. And if we are to be of one voice, then we need to preach about sin. Because sin is not an, an, an old-fashioned and an outdated word. We try to flower up, right? We try to flower it up so that it, it, it doesn't sting as much. Greed and selfishness. Well, no, that's not greed and selfishness. That's just prosperity and ambition. Pornography and, uh, and obscenity. Well, that's just art, right? That's freedom of speech. Abortion. Well, that's just a choice. Adultery. That's an open marriage, right? Sexual immorality. No, that's sexual freedom. Homosexuality. No, that's just an alternative lifestyle. The list could go on and on and on, but the truth of the matter is this. Sin is rampant in the world, and we need to call sin for what it is. I was talking, watching a talk show once, and the woman was asked, are you having an affair? And she said, well, yes, I am. And the host said, well, well, why are you having this affair? Don't you see anything wrong with it? And her answer blew me away. She says, I believe in God, and God wants me to be happy. And if this man makes me happy, it's what God wants it to be. Now, let me ask you this. Find where in Scripture it says God wants me to be happy. You can't find it in it. God wants me to be obedient. He doesn't want me to be happy. Happy comes as a result of being obedient. Happiness is, is a blessing that God gives us. Contentment. Joy, happiness, a result of being obedient. What God wants from us is to be obedient. What is God's greatest desire? That all men be saved. Well, the way to be saved is we have to be obedient to God's word. Sin is sin. Look at even Webster's Dictionary, and it will tell you what sin is. It says it is a vitiated state of human nature in which the self is estranged from God. The word vitiate means to make or render useless. So what Webster's Dictionary is even telling us is the same thing that God's Word is telling us, yeah. is that we've all sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God. We need to speak the truth so that those who are sinning know what is wrong. We need to speak the truth about what sin is and what it does to us. We are dead in our sins. And people don't care about that until they hear the truth. We need to speak the truth in one voice. Because they have to be warned. 
And we need to warn them with a sense of urgency. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This truth needs to be taught. Christianity is not a feel-good religion. Christianity is about changing the way you were to the way God wants you to be to have eternity with Him. We need to be one voice telling the truth about sin. We need to preach the truth about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about this because this truly just blows me away. Before the creation of the world, before God spoke into existence the heavens and the earth, God had a plan for us. God wanted us to be with Him. Even though we rejected God, even though we mocked God, even though we spit in the face of God, God carried out His plan because God loved us and carried His plan out. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you. That's me. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's word tells us that Christ died for us. God's word tells us that he came down from heaven to rescue us from this, this useless, sinful state we were in and are in. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is the truth. God loves us. But Christ didn't just die for our sins. He rose from the dead. And that makes all the difference in the world. You look at any other person who is heading up a religion. They're still in the grave. Or their bones are in the grave, but not our Savior. Our Savior's tomb is empty. And that makes all the difference in the world. So that when we are buried with Him in baptism, we are also resurrected with Him in life. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, we should no longer be slaves to sin. We need to be one voice preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are now no longer slaves to sin, but we walk in newness of life. And that should bring us joy and happiness. That's where the happiness comes from. We've been reconciled to God. We now have eternity with our Creator. And we need to be preaching about the truth of the hope we have. Hope in what? Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And that's not a hope like, oh, I hope it stops raining, or I hope it continues to rain for the crops, See, that is wishful thinking. When God's Word talks about hope, that is an assured expectation. It is a guaranteed expectation. So the hope we have in Christ Jesus is something we can take to the bank because that is true. To be a one voice, we need to preach the Word of God because God's Word has the power to change lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the wonder of God. God takes us where we are and then changes us and shapes us and molds us and guides us to where he wants us to be. That's the beauty of being a Christian. Christianity is about a daily change to be more like Christ today than I was yesterday. 
to be more like Christ tomorrow than I am today. It is about a change, a daily change. A lot of people don't like change, but that's exactly what Christianity is about. See, the gospel is not complicated. That's the beauty of it. It is so simple. We hear the word. We believe and act upon that belief. We confess our sins, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. We repent. That means we turn back toward God. Yeah. We are then immersed, buried with Jesus Christ in that watery grave to rise up in newness of life, to live faithfully. That is the gospel in a nutshell. That's the beauty of it. It is so simple. How in the world can we mess that up? We mess it up when we stop talking and preaching the word of God. Here's the beauty of being in Christ. God knows that we're going to slip and fall. God knows that we're going to mess up because we're human. But 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And that word cleanses is a continual cleansing. Why? Because God knows we're going to mess up. God knows that we're going to stumble and fall. But it's a continual cleansing. See, a lot of people think that just because we become Christians, we no longer sin. That's not the case. If we do, then we call God a liar. Again, we need to preach the truth. They believe that once we become a Christian, that our life is now a bed of roses. No. We're still going to face hard times. We're still going to face trials and tribulations. Let me tell you this, if the apostles' lives were not a walk in the park, what makes you think our life is going to be a walk in the park? But here's the beauty of it. Here's the truth of it. God will always be by our side. God is never going to leave us. God is never going to forsake us. God will lift us up when we fall. God will carry us when we are tired. God will strengthen us when we are weak. And I say this all the time to my church family. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Amen. To have all of that. Amen. But here's the thing. If we are going to be of one voice, here's the best sermon anyone will ever hear. The best sermon anyone will ever hear is the sermon we live. I found this poem. And it said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes are better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. The best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action. Your tongue too fast may run. The lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get lessons by observing what you do. I may not understand the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. The best sermon anyone will ever hear is the one we live. And if we live by God's word, if we live by God's truth, we will be one voice. I want to close out with this story I heard of a missionary. Traveled to, to many places sharing the gospel. And he had a driver that go, would go with him. And they would go to these little areas all around the country. And on this one particular stop, the woman came early, sat down up on the front row. And as soon as the missionary got in, introduced himself, and he began to speak. And about five minutes into his lesson, she gets up and runs out as fast as she can. About five minutes later, she runs back in as fast as she can and plops herself back up on the front row. Well, after he finishes his lesson, he goes and finds this young lady and asks her what the emergency was. She said, well, when I first began to listen to you, I was very interested in what you had to say. And so I got up and I ran out as fast as I could to find your driver. To ask your driver if you live what you were teaching. And he said, you were. And when I found that out, 
I had to come back in to listen to what you had to say. Our conversation, our actions, reveal whose we are, reveals what we are. And if we are going to speak as one voice, we need to preach the truth and only the truth, and we need to live the truth and only the truth. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Most loving, righteous Heavenly Father, you are God Almighty. You are the creator of heavens and earth. You are God. And we are truly humbled to be able to come to you tonight. To be able to come to you at any time. To rejoice with you. To lay our burdens at your feet. Lord, we pray that we heed your truth. That we do not come up with man's truth. But we listen to what you have to tell us, what you have to say. Help us to hunger and thirst for your word. Help us to dive into your word every day. And to not just know your word, dear Lord, but to live your word. So that as we go out into the world, people will see us and see you in us. And they will want to come to know you because of how you have changed our lives through your truth. Thank you so much, dear God for your word, for your truth. Most importantly, we thank you for your son, for the death, burial, and resurrection, dear Lord, his example of always seeking your will. May we seek your will always in how we teach and in how we live. As through your son we pray. Amen.